Hey there, Dane Cash here. Before you go any further, I'm going to take a quick moment of your time to say that if you've ever considered becoming an Escape Collective member, now is a great time to do it. It's Tour de France season, and you won't want to miss our members-only shows over the next few weeks. You also won't want to hit a paywall when you're trying to read our racing analysis or our deep dives into tech. And on top of that, you can get your first month for just $1 right now. Head on over to escapecollective.com slash TDF and sign up. Welcome back to the Escape Collective Tour Daily Podcast, everybody. I'm Kaylee Fretz. Johnny Long, set. Is that a beautiful scene for me? We are standing outside, standing up, the, outside the Bounty Pub, which is... The, I don't think it's a full Irish pub. I don't think it's an Irish pub at all. It's one of those tourist pubs that has the pictures of the food outside to try and tempt you in, but the pictures of the food outside actually stop you from coming in. <laughs> but we're here I've to never watch got the... That. Uh, <laughs> England Euros match with one no down at half time. We've stepped outside at half time. It's pretty rough. To recap the Tour de France we're stage. Gonna, we're Everyone's tr- looking at us, it's grand. We're back in the tour. We're back this in the tour. We're, we're putting on a show for everybody that's sitting here watching the uh, the England game, which we just won't talk about because. Well, we'll catch up later. This yeah. podcast will be done in bits. <laughs> stage two of the 2024 Great Tour stage. de France. Chesnatico to Bologna, a fantastic stage. Pretty decent size on these 10 rider breakaway. Ended up going up the road pretty quickly. And of course, we had these final climbs into Bologna, uh, a series of climbs that are used in the Giro della Miglia uh, quite frequently. And so we thought, which I think is a reasonable thing to think, that Primoz Roglic would, would feature heavily today. He's, a, I think, a three time winner of that race. He's Was won- he in the race today? Yeah, he's I th- somewhere. Right in. Although a friend of mine pointed out that he, he, he wins every other year. And he won last year, so he can't. He couldn't win here uh, this year. Yep, yeah, makes sense. We also didn't introduce Ronan. Welcome, Ronan. Oh yeah, hey. thank you. It's about time. I've been standing <laughs> here answering your questions for five minutes now. <laughs> yeah, that's just me. We'll we'll get the hang of this by like Nice. Let me get back to France. By twenty forty. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we had two races today. We had a race mm. for the breakaway. We had a race for the stage win that ended up getting won by Kevin Vaclin. There was kind of a third race as well because throughout the stage it was like. Are the peloton chasing? Are they not chasing? Mm. Well, they were, and then they weren't, yeah. and then well, they were a- again. They, it was what? It was up to eight or nine minutes, and then it came down to about five, and then there was a pretty serious crash with a bunch of Visma riders in particular. Uh, I saw at the finish line, Walt Van Aert's kind of banged up arm. Matteo Jorgensen looked pretty banged up, so not a great day for Visma Lisa Bike, except that in the other race today, in the race for the yellow jersey in the race for the GC, Jonas Vingo showed that he is here to play. And he jumped on Tadej Pogacar's wheel instantly. So quick. I mean, there wasn't enough time to actually consider whether Vingo would be able to jump on his wheel because it just happened. Like, Ronan Tentum was like, that was quick. Pogacar's attack was impressive. Vingo's response was like, he responded before Pogacar had even yeah. moved. <laughs> it's like he told he him, he was like, I'm going to go here. If you just come with me, then, yeah. you know. Which, okay, let's, let's sort of dive into the psychology of that a little bit, maybe, Ronan. Because you, 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 you've been in this, in this position, I've been in this position. When you're feeling good, you react quickly. Yes. When you're feeling bad, you take a second to think about it, right? Exactly, yeah. If, you're, if, if you have the legs, you, even if you have the legs, you might take a second to think about it. He didn't even today. That's, it was a clear mm. indication he's on good form, he's feeling good today. That's not necessarily a clear indication he's going to be good on something like Galibier or something. Yeah. But in terms of is Vinico ready to race this race, yeah. we got a clear indication today that he is. And we got a clear indication that others were not. They had yes. that split second hesitation. Mm-hmm. And bar two riders, I think we'll probably discuss later, none of them had the legs to come back. Well, let's let's sort of start the show with the GC chat today because you know as much as we love sweet Kevin Vaclan, uh, I I'm, I don't know that much about him, and I don't. Shall I shall I give a brief overview? Yeah. When I did a bit of research, won the Tour des Alpes Maritimes at Duval. Uh, solid rider then. Solid rider won uh, the Tour of the Jura. Came second at Flesh Well on this year, and he was Tom Squinch's uh, Escape Collective draft pick. And Tom's does know. And Tom's knows these things. Yeah. So he's a, he's a, he's a rider that's good. He that was straight on French TV. That's, that's in February, he yeah. picked Vauclin. <laughs> yeah. None of us even considered him this morning. And he it's, picked him in February. It's Vauclin, right? Vauclin. Vauclin. Yeah, because in the, when we're in the press room watching the race, you, ca- you are like, why do they keep talking about Thomas Vauclin? 
And you're like, no, I wasn't really Kevin paying Vakala. attention, and it's all in French. Vakala. And I was like, what? Uh, they... Two French winners well, in a row, because, though. Pretty fun. Because Vogler's also previously been on the motorbike, and so when I when I did sort of perk up still on to the listen, today. yeah, still, yeah, I was yeah, on still the motorbike there. for on French television. So I was like, are they just talking to Vogler? But then I actually started listening and realized they're talking about the bike racer. Well, I, well, I kick us off from the GC conversation. Yeah, and yeah. I'm not really a GC contender, but the current GC leader heading into today, Bardet, because I think his team tactics played a big part in what actually unfolded today. With the brake getting that large gap, it kind of all made sense for DSM because with the brake taking the stage, they take not only they take time bonuses away from the stage mm-hmm. finish line, but they take the time bonuses that were on offer at the first time up San Luca. Yeah. yeah. Which also theoretically, if it's an easier day coming into San Luca, maybe Bardet has a better chance of sticking with the GC riders. Yep. Ultimately, that didn't really work out for them. And his time in yellow, we were discussing earlier today, could last for a week. It only lasted One day. for a day. Yeah, uh, but it could have gone either way, right? I mean, we were expecting, well, we were expecting this from Pogaccio yesterday, basically. What we saw today is what we were expecting mm. yesterday and today. Turns out yesterday didn't really, really work out. We're going to hear from Jack Haig later in this episode. We got a little Jack Haig diary for you. And he mentioned the fact that Ayuso was dropped yesterday. And that's maybe why UAE kind of like turned off the taps a little bit. Uh, but we did see what we were sort of expecting to see today, which was Pogaccio go ape over that climb. And were we expecting that though? Because he w- he was sort of I'm not going to say he was isolated, but UAE weren't exactly amassing on front of the peloton no. there. Yeah, it was attack the best form of defense for Pogaccio. I think so. Well, especially Visma Lisa bike had numbers there, and we we saw early in the stage they were putting on the front intermittently, and we were like that that surely must mean that Vingo is is feeling good. Yeah, interesting point there, Ronan. That UAE was not what we were expecting because on paper, and we said this in the preview, they are the strongest team here, right? Particularly climbers. I think the strongest tour team ever. <laughs> yeah, like it is. It is wild how strong they are. It's and just slightly exaggerated. And Pogacar had Yates, and that was it. Mm-hmm. I think in the finale, uh, unless there was somebody hanging out in the back of that group. I mean, that group is still 30, 40 strong. strong. It could have been somebody hiding. But in terms of riding the front, like we see Visma do all the time. Gates is the only one there. What also struck me today was, I mean, where that theory sort of falls down in attack being defense is that, and by attacking, Pogaccio was potentially putting himself into yellow and so heaping more pressure onto his team. But what I found was interesting was... He's never one thing, cared about that, though. Well, one thing I've never quite understood is this whole, like, no matter where they're sprinting for, the GC contenders sprint for the line at the end of every stage and seemingly, to me, waste a heck of a lot of energy sprinting for... It, it seems to be just like a wanting to beat each other sort of thing yeah. rather than psychological actually, yeah psychological yes hey, hey, hey. Phil Foden you beautiful man <laughs> we're gonna have to apologize to uh, podcast listeners who detest football slash soccer <laughs> uh, yep it, uh, well, we're, we're 48 minutes into the, yeah. into the match here and Phil Foden just equalized for England for England England uh, <laughs> But what, what I was just going to say though was like coming. Rona doesn't care at all. No, no I mean we're discussing <laughs> Pagacha here. It's much more important. <laughs> just what struck me about the sprint of the finish line today, when Ramco and uh, Carapaz had caught Vinigo and Pagacha, the sprint for the finish line, Pagacha did not contest it at all. It was almost as if like he was aware that he was about to go into yellow, and maybe if he conceded enough places without losing time, yeah, one, maybe Remco could take yellow or Carapaz could take yellow because they were in that same time group yesterday. So in the press conference with Tadej Pogacar, because the yellow jersey has to do one every day where he gets beamed into the into the press room, gets he, to do a few questions. He did avoid us at the mix zone, though. He did. <laughs> That's alright. But what he said was, <laughs> as the day was panning out, he was like, it was perfect because we had to break up the road with loads of oh, goal oh checks. no, oh, this is gonna I was going to joke about that. <laughs> It's outside. it's outside. Okay, anyway. Oh, God. <laughs> Sorry. So in the Yellow Jersey press conference, which, which today Pogaccio has to do every day, right, uh, the Yellow Jersey has to do every day, he said that it was a perfect race scenario where the brake were up the road, the Yellow was still going to get carried on to someone else, or, you know, he wouldn't have to worry about it all the stage win, and then he could give his team a bit of a rest. So he's already thinking about not using his team up. Yep. Which may... Does that give an insight into it, into where his head was at? I'm not sure, but... I think it gives an insight into one thing that I was thinking about watching the final few kilometers today. I'm not going to use the the, the, the phrase, it's not a day you can win the tour, but <laughs> it, it actually isn't a day you can it, win the it tour. It literally it's also, isn't a day you yeah, can win the tour. It's also, yeah. it's also not a day you would lose the tour, yeah. but it's a day where you could spend a heck of a lot of energy because of the heat that the Reddish mm. wanted to put up with. Yeah, it was the same yeah. story yesterday. Yep. And putting your team through that, if it's going to be the same again tomorrow, 
is not something any of the top teams is going to want to be doing at the moment. The only good thing you think, if we're going to spin zone for Pogaccia, yeah. is that this is the first time he's worn the yellow jersey since that Calder Grand on stage in 2022. So whatever you know the permutations yep. are, it must feel good to be back in the race lead of the Tour de France. It must give you some sort of lift to be like, okay, even if there are you know potential piles down the road, at least I'm in the race lead and it's in my control. Yep. Is that a segue or a segue? Potholes in the road and Matteo Jorgensen crashing today because I, I was going. Oh. <laughs> Let's segue. <laughs> Didn't well, mean to. Why did okay. Matteo Jorgensen crash? He crashed because he two riders in front of him split just as he had his hand and his musette to take a bottle out. Oh, and oh there was no. a pothole in the road. No. I haven't seen any potholes since he came to Italy. No, yeah, the road was good, yeah, wasn't it? The, like, most of the route has been resurfaced. We we drove in front and head of the course yesterday. Yeah. On route and most of the route seemed like it had been resurfaced. Yeah. He found the one pothole in Italy yesterday. <laughs> Today That's even. definitely not true. The one pothole on this race course, maybe. I'm going to go with the one pothole in Italy. And <laughs> At least in the middle to hard. north. Came down hard, <laughs> brought down Wolf and with him. Uh, moment, definite moment of panic for yeah. his Melissa bike. Yeah. Uh, speaking that data to center States, would have the control room van would have been. I mean the flashing uh, red. The, the automatic <laughs> jersey analysis tool would have been saying would have been on high alert for yeah. <laughs> two Vis Melissa bike jerseys on the ground. <laughs> Uh, thankfully, both riders seem to be okay. Jorgensen yeah. is, himself is definitely absolutely fine. Yeah. Um, but still, no, not something you really want to happen. So yeah. Pogac is in yellow. Then Vingo, Evanapol, and Carapaz are all on the same time. Yep. Pretty Let's, good. I want to talk about Remco. That, the way he... The way he came across. Yeah. Okay, so... so Kelly, just before you go on to Remco. Yeah. Vingo descending today. Is, has he been taking some lessons from Van Aert or something over the winter? He, is, he the looked, descending? Yeah. I mean, he was pretty damn good last year, wasn't he? Was he? The time trial? I, Remember that? Yeah. Granted, but... He was pretty damn good. Uh, uh, I mean, the, like, the, whenever they've descended together, it was Pogaccia that was, was the one that fell down, if I, if I remind you. <laughs> good point, <laughs> so, actually. Rather handshake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, I think there's this weird... I mean, I, I remember you and I both saying that he wasn't a particularly good descender last year, and I'm not sure... That was accurate. That was accurate. <laughs> like, I mean, we had that sense, I don't know, just because he was tiny. He had had some sort of bobbles before, but he certainly had figured it out. Like, I, I, I'm not worried about that for him mm. at all anymore. It's all relative as well. Like, he would easily drop. Pretty much everybody. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know okay. who else couldn't follow Pogaccio today? <laughs> no, probably not. The, Slovenian, the Slovenian fans? <laughs> the chaos as he came back to the bus after getting his yellow jersey was, was a sight to behold. There was a footpath in Bologna that turned into the 100 meter sprint in the Olympics uh, with, with a whole line of fans chasing behind him. It's good to watch, him. isn't and it? Pogaccio and TV. Was, Pogaccio was properly like winding them up. He was like calling people in to join in and, like the, <laughs> the, 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 the bus that was forming behind him, the train that was forming behind him, chasing him down the street. I mean, I, he has more fun in the yellow jersey. Are he just more fun at the Tour de France than yeah. any rider I think I've ever seen? The only possible exception being like Rigoberto Uran with the Colombians, who has an absolute blast every time he's here. We all kind of thought Sagan was fun, but in hindsight... Sagan had, had a good fun, yeah, mm. but, but he, he, didn't, he didn't like amp people up like that. Yeah. yeah. He was he fun in the darkest it. hour of the tour, when we were all suffering under the Team Sky dominance. <laughs> yeah. So Evan and Paul, are we yeah, ready we're, to let, Let's get back to Remco. So, you know, we're, we're watching on phones at the finish line, right, because we're waiting over by the buses so we can, we can talk to folks, and missed big sections of it but turns out we just watched the replay they didn't actually show much of it so all mm. of a sudden they're, they're back on the flats right after the descent coming back in towards the finish here in Bologna they're, they're kind of cruising around the edge of the, of the city center basically and there's Remco and Richard Carapaz just motoring yeah. up mostly Remco mostly yeah. Remco yeah. What, we seen on t what we've seen on TV almost entirely Remco yeah. Carapaz mostly gap. drafting all but, the way up but to be yeah. fair to Carapaz he then looked good yeah, he let Remco close the gap, and then he went for the sprint. Yep. And he, and he looked good in the sprint, to be which fair. is what he should do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I guess I guess sort of the broader point here is that you know Remco was there were other GC favorites behind, right? Roglic maybe didn't have an amazing day. In fact, he was actually distanced for a little bit, and then I think got some help from from Jai Hindley and others to get back up into the main group. Remco was the one who was able to take the initiative. Yeah. Yes, he didn't follow the initial move. Frankly, if I watched that move go, I'm not sure I would want to follow it either, right? Like I, if, I if think it was one of those where Vinigo was impressive in following, but he was also in the right place. Yeah. yeah. And if you weren't in the right place... It was gone. Yeah. Yeah. Was that, so, 
he, he, he took advantage of a, of a speedy descent, and then, and this is the thing that's, I think, important, is remember, he had a fantastic time trial. At the Dauphiné. At the Dauphiné. And not so good in the mountains, and I'm wondering if we're going to see something similar from him at the Tour de France, because basically what that effort was, was a time trial effort, mm -hmm. right? And he absolutely closed that gap on Tadej Pogacar. Granted, Vingigo had stopped pulling. Pogacar definitely was not going to go 110% to pull Vingigo to the line, so it's not, a, it's not sort of a, a direct one-to-one -one thing, but still hugely impressive. Well, that's what Pidcock said uh, afterwards. He was like, you see Pogaccia attack off the front, and he was like, immediately in my mind, I, I remembered watching him at this year's Giro, where it's like, I know what he's going to do to everyone. Do I want to completely burn myself trying to chase down a guy I can't chase down? Yeah. So you, apart from Vingago, and then that's, you can now add Evanapol into the camp of like, has the belief in himself to be like, those guys aren't gone forever up the road. I, yeah. I hadn't heard that Pidcock quote, and that's no. interesting because like, yeah. how, how much... Like obviously, Pogaccia and, and Vinigo are, are a step above anyway. Yeah. But how much is just a psychological thing? They also where they're. I mean, at this point, yeah. two steps above because yeah. they are one Must step be, right? above. Must if be at least a bit. If you raise that Giro with with Pogaccia, you're not following him anymore, no. right? You saw what happened to, to Ben <laughs> yeah, O'Connor. You're like, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> There's more life to be lived than trying to follow his wheel. <laughs> But no, a great, a great uh, maybe this is what we expected from yesterday. Maybe maybe because last year it all kicked off on the first stage. So a day where there was an action between Vingo and Pogaccio, we were like, hang on, what's going on? But yeah, we only yeah. had to wait one more day and we got what we wanted. And now, this, now the stage is set, right? The race is back on between these two. And when we ha while we have Carapaz and Evanapol not far away, it's going to be more interesting than it was last year. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, maybe the race for third place is going to be the most interesting yeah. part. Yeah, but yeah, great stage. Fantastic. Early, but early for saying that. That was a bit doom and gloom there. But Fantastic stage. And, um, you know, we like Bologna more than we like Rimini. So, <laughs> yeah, sorry not to about return that yesterday. To that. <laughs> Guys, you've seen even less of Bologna. I'm not going to, like, just as I defended no, Rimini yesterday. You just feel and, it, like, look where we are. <laughs> it's beautiful. We're outside a bounty pub. Yeah, Come but on. even in Bologna, the bounty pub is. We know. have, there's a member of ours who is a, a Bologna resident, and uh, he confirmed for us that Bologna is great, which uh, unsurprisingly, he lives here, right? Uh, but also that Rimini is a hellhole, so I don't feel too bad. I don't feel too bad, but should we? That's the tourism update. <laughs> yeah, the tourism update. Kelly's just set us up for a repeat of last night, like re-listening re to the podcast to see if we've been too hard on Rimini. Too yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did, I did listen that back was and I was like, were we, too mean? <laughs> <laughs> were we too mean? I want to talk about Ruglitch. Yep. Uh, because the coverage is a bit spotty there, but we did see him gap off just a little bit, kind of like 15, 20 seconds before Pogacar went. Now, the conspiracy theorists among us might say that the two are connected. Uh, wouldn't even be that, be that conspiratorial, actually. There's probably a race radio that said... <laughs> the tactically astute might say that was connected. <laughs> per, per, perhaps perhaps uh, from a control van. Somebody UAE's. noticed from UAE's control... I reckon they've got a control ball pit. <laughs> Well, or, or like we were talking to JV yesterday, and he said they have a control couch, yes. right? So, uh, yeah, somebody noticed it, and they might have put that in, into Pogacar's ear, and that would have been the opportunity to go. Uh, I also think that it's pretty likely that Pogacar was going anyway. Regardless, point being, Broglic, little gap open, not a great sign at that particular moment. No. Uh, he was able to bring it back. But, you know, this is a rider who I think we're, we're mostly thinking was, was sort of the, at the top of the list for third place, right? Yeah. Yes and no. Like, this, that San Luca claim is so much about positioning coming into it. And we've just had Kit at home message to say that he may have been caught behind a split and Vlasov dropped back and helped bridge him up. I mean, you don't bridge up if you've been dropped. Yeah. I also don't think Roglic would be dropped on today's stage. I mean, like I said, and he's basically won on this climb before. Yeah. Right? I, I'm watching it live. The gap that, that Adam Yates forced seemed to appear out of nowhere. It was like, how did that gap happen? Mm. It was almost like maybe someone had a drop chain or maybe there was like yeah. a random straggler in the middle of the group who just popped and opened up a huge gap or whatever. But yeah. I'm not... I'm not sure we can read too much on the Roglic losing time well, I, today. So I did speak to Jai Hindley after the after the stage. He's cooling down. Uh, had just chatted with SBS and oh yeah, it was uh, just full gas, uh, cooking out there all day, and uh, really 
on and off uh, on the climbs and uh, yeah it was a pretty strange day and then uh, yeah just uh, full gas basically both times up uh, Chisholm, up San Luca. I mean <laughs> yeah if I had the legs I would also be up there <laughs> but uh, no I just uh, was yeah I was really on the limit and uh, yeah it was just an all-out effort to to be in the group and then yeah once we hit the flow I could come to the front and uh, pull with Alex and I think we could limit the losses as best as we could uh, so yeah I think it was uh, good teamwork in the end and uh, we gave it everything only uh, well, 48 hours into the race <laughs> of a three-week race so yeah there's plenty of racing to come and uh, yeah, I mean, it's not been too bad, I think. It uh, wasn't a disaster day. Uh, I think uh, I think the team rode really well. Also, before the final circuits, the boys were really great with the sport and uh, plenty of racing to come. So it's the evolution of the sport. It's uh, The racing style is changing quite a bit. I mean, you go super easy and then, and then everyone gets told in the radio there's a corner coming and then the, and that's full gas with, uh, I don't know, 150k to go for some reason. For sure everyone's uh, finding the, the race through them again and, uh, yeah, I mean, we're only two days in, so, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there hasn't been so much racing yet, but uh, well, I think it's been pretty exciting, no? Yeah, I mean, obviously the conditions are really, really challenging. Uh, also, yesterday was super hot, so... Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think it was too bad, to be honest. Uh, and, yeah, happy me and Alex were there in the final tail belt. The good thing is, is that this is like a first taste of what, what may be to come in the GC battle. We don't even have to wait that long. So we've only got sprint stage tomorrow, and then we've got the Glibier. So then we'll know. There won't be any of this days and days of wondering and pontificating what will happen. We will know. You might yeah. regret that, though, if we know, and then there's th two and a half weeks of knowing. <laughs> that was like the uh, 2021 tour, when Pikachu won that stage oh, five yeah. time trial. And then everyone after was like, oh, uh, tour's over. Yeah. Yeah. And it was. Yeah. Nah. So we're not too worried about Ruglitch, but maybe maybe just minor, minor cause for concern. Uh, yeah, I chatted with Ralph Aldag as well, his director, and, and actually Ralph hadn't actually even seen most of it yet, so he didn't have any answers for me. He's like, you know more than I do at this point. On, the, on that point as and well. I didn't know anything, so. <laughs> <laughs> on the point of not worrying about Roglic on that claim today, like we should also just mention how different that San Luca claim is to to what a GC contender can usually do. Yeah, that, and, that is and Pogaccia important. is a different species, so is Vinigo. Beyond that, because Roglic or, I don't know, Bernal, Garen Thomas, Rodriguez, whoever is in the yeah. like wh whatever way they fared in today's time, is much pu more punchier, and typically GC riders aren't mm -hmm. all that punchy. Yeah. Except Pogaccia and Vinigo. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean... Well, thank God we got two of them. Right? Yeah. Because if there's only one... I mean, that was our concern, is that Vingigo wouldn't be there, right? Yeah. And that was the an that was the question that was answered today. And I think, yeah. that, like, above all, that is the question that was but answered even today. Even still, though, I, don't I wouldn't take from today that Vingigo will be there. I'm not two saying two he weeks won't, from now. No, 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 no. But yeah. today is no guarantee that he yeah. is fully there the way he was in the past two years. I mean, we've been saying throughout the, all these sort of, like, intro to the tour episodes, right? Like, you get your 20-minute power back before you get your your two and a half weeks in power back, yeah. right? So the durability question, which is a big question. Th and today was a relatively easier stage also. Yeah. Not chasing the break, not bringing it back, no, not going for stage one. They came into that claim today considerably fresher than they otherwise could have. Yep. Should we return to the break real quick? Uh, again, yes. again, massive congrats to Kevin Boclin and, uh, and all of France. Really. Okay, Airbnb. They've got they've got two stage winners in two days, which is uh, France doesn't win stages that often actually anymore. Uh, the new Victor Lefay, perhaps. Hmm. You gonna pick him next year? I'll put him in my in my fantasy team next year for damn sure. What else do we we know? Um, we're watching the breakaway, and my, my call out of the break, uh, breakaway was actually a Colombian rider on Astana named Harold Tejada. And Ronan, you actually sat in a taxi with him for about an hour. Are we going to Reason. tell the story now? I thought we were going to keep that story for After Dark. Oh, we can tell oh, After Dark. Oh, well, yeah, let's, let's well, do I that. Well, now I just set it up, and we can say it's going in After Dark. Hmm. Nice. How and when I shared a taxi with Harold to Tejada. Yeah. Within the last six weeks, I might add. <laughs> yep. So for those who don't listen to this podcast the rest of the year, After Dark is for members only. You need to go sign up and make sure you get access to that. Again, this month, it is only $1. Head hmm. to escapecollective.com slash TDF. Get signed up. You'll also hear about his Irish teammate on Astana. 
which we didn't even know about. Frankly, I don't even know. About shocking it. news. His shock, teammate doesn't even know he was shocking, Irish. Shocking, <laughs> shocking news. Uh, we have a couple of corrections corner bits yes. for today, Johnny. Kaylee. I mean, the big, the biggest is really, and something that as a as a father, I am just repeated deeply, in the podcast and the Spin Cycle newsletter. Yeah. Like so, so not only was I wrong, but I was responsible for you being wrong. Yeah. And that's really, it's quite horrible. So, and and this is a big one. So the the, the tattoo on the back of Jonas Vingegaard's hand, put there at the request, put there at the request of his daughter, sorry we had a, a brief soccer moment, uh, was not Marshall. It was not Marshall. As I incorrectly claimed. Nope. It was Zuma. Yes. And I should have known better, and I regret the error. I mean, Paw Patrol, no pop too, no job too big, no pop too small, but I mean, <laughs> I kind of think that the England job might be the too big for them. <laughs> Was um okay, okay, I don't want to make another mistake so we have to do another poor patrol correction, but may the confusion have come because Marshall and Zuma both are firefighting pups. Yeah. Yeah? Is that I mean, it? And I and I and I you know, I fully put my hand in the air that Paw Patrol is not my children's favourite and so i I'm not as well versed as I am in some other things. That's fine. Much to my yeah. disappointment, my daughter's favourite Paw Patrol pup is Sky and oh, not yeah. Everest. No and I would have thought that Everest, you know, her dad yeah, being come on. Come yeah. on. But yeah, my, maybe my, when she's older. Yeah. If you want Lucas the Spider Facts, I got Lucas the Spider Facts. In fact, I can pretty much recite all, all the episodes. But Paw Patrol? Lucas the Spider, that doesn't fill me with joy. It's I want to know more about how the pups are saving Adventure City once again. That's the only correction, right? Um, that is the only correction. Didn't you have another one? No. I mean, we mess up things so yeah. regularly that really if we did them all, it would just be a whole show. We could have yeah. a rest a corrections corner. We never rest a corrections corner. Did special. we? No, we could do. Oh, we could do. <laughs> I think that was the big one, though. That was the one I really felt like I needed to apologize for. Well, we didn't mention it yesterday, and people being like, uh, you haven't <laughs> done the corrections corner for Paw Patrol, guys. It's like, okay, fine. <laughs> I think we did mention it off mic. We we're going to save it for... Yeah, I think we forgot. Mm. Guys, I want to I wanna just sort of step back. Okay, so we've talked GC. We've talked about the breakaway today. We've talked about the actual bike race. Just sort of general vibes out of this Tour de France so far. I mean, we... Well, love we really, not in France. We love the city that we're in right now. It's been... Yeah, it's been a good start. Florence, like, how has the Italian start been? Good. It's been chaotic. There's not the level of French policing, that you, obviously, that you get at the Tour because we're in Italy, which means that the public are just everywhere. The riders are trying to, like, just ride through crowds, like, too fast that they're going to, like, hurt themselves. Like, not saying this is why Jan Hurt basically knocked his front teeth out because that was, like, a, a whole thing, like, got caught on a, like, a camera strap or something. Well, let's and it's not the rider's fault, but it's just, like, it's chaos. Like, the finish is just chaos. Wow, 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 wow. Let's talk about this a little bit. So, okay. so just as, as, I don't think we mentioned this on the pod, did we? Cause, so, Jan Hurt was crashed by before a spectator. Before the start of stage one. Before the start of stage one yesterday, he, like, chipped a bunch of teeth. So, he's off to the dentist. Of course, this is, this is not great, right? Like, the rider should be allowed to ride around unaccosted. <laughs> but let's be honest. Like... If the three of us just went like running through this group of people, <laughs> Declan Rice just missed it. Okay, that was actually quite difficult. Uh, no, no, we were talking about this before. Like, the riders actually do need to slow down. Like, they yeah. haul ass around the start, it is start areas. It is ridiculous. And, like, it, they're just asking for trouble, right? They also seem to double down in where they, like, get extra annoyed that there's a bigger crowd there, so they go extra fast. And it's like, I mean, guys, the only person who's going to suffer if you... Is you. Yeah, if you take yourself out of the Tour de France, because, yeah. Yeah. like, these, this, the fans and the spectators, it's like cycling on a shared use path. Yeah. The other users of that path do not realize... How fast a, you can go. Yeah, exactly. It, if you follow the Escape Collective Instagram, you'll have seen us doing a little video of uh, Michele Gazzoli's bike, because he was the first rider to quit the Tour de France, but his bike was outside the bus this morning, presumably to get taken away on a car because I don't need it anymore. And as I was trying to film the video, oh, my, I almost crashed Bob Jungles. He wasn't necessarily going that fast, but he was kind of very pissed off with me. He was kind of moving. I did feel bad. Anyway, um, we didn't it's, see it's the kinda, we, we didn't watch the Jan Hurt incident, but I'm just going to say that... I've seen the aftermath of it. Yeah, b based off of the other things that we see riders do, it's like, guys, chill out. Like, we're, we're I know not, you're you're stressed out. You're trying to get somewhere. You're trying to get sign on. You're trying to get back to the bus. You're trying to get whatever it is. But, like, there's a shitload of people walking it's not around. not a surprise that the tour is going to be busy. Yeah, uh, just like you got to... You gotta chill. I want to clarify: we're not blaming Jan Hurt for whatever happened yesterday. No, no, no. no. But 
like, it's just inevitable myself, if you I'm roll out fast. I'm absolutely paranoid of potentially bringing a rider down. Yeah. That is like my worst nightmare right now. Yeah. And still, as much as I check, you know, it's like the Green Cross code when I go to fucking walk from one bus to yeah, the next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Hedgehogs, you remember what they <laughs> said on the telly, yeah? <laughs> look left, look right, look up, look down, look, yeah. turn around. <laughs> and still, I'm like stepping out and stopping to do the Green Cross code again yeah. Yeah. because they come that fast. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's great that fans can get so close. But in France, there's everyone sort of figured out how where the limits are. Of well, it all. And, and in and in France, a lot of the, a lot of the time the buses are more like blocked off. I mean, yeah, it's true. pretty frequent. Pretty frequently, you need a credential to get into the buses. Yeah, VIP or media. Yeah. And here, most of the buses have been just out in the public. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah. I mean, it's it, the like, same in the are Bilbao inevitable. last so year. I, I, yeah. You know, I don't know. Like as we drive through things like that, I don't expect fans to know what to do. Because they don't. No. That's right. So there's just, there's a bit of uh, responsibility on both sides. Anyway. Anyway. I, yeah. I, I, that's just a, apart from that. The Italian Grand Depart has been I, amazing. Like, I don't quite yeah, understand yeah. why before the start in the morning the bus zone is it's cordoned open. off. It was cordoned off this morning. Well, half of it wasn't. Half it was cordoned off. That's a bigger question then. But in the in the in the evening after the finish of the stages, it's a complete free for all. Yeah. Uh, and like a free for all is great enough saying that's wrong, but. Um, it's, it's the disparity it's like why is one one way and the other is the other way yeah, I, yeah. I don't quite but yeah great fun well well designed stages I think so beautiful far beautiful stages um, different tastes but the fans seem to have been loving it everyone's out on the road yep riders seem to be enjoying it Cause sometimes you go to I mean it's different because it's, it's France but sometimes you'll have these uh, foreign grand departs and the riders won't necessarily race it the way they would yeah. uh, on roads that they know but I guess the Italian riders just have the local rider who go off in the solo yeah, yeah. or the yeah. like Magnus Court or something, or, you, or you just don't have the the available terrain that that Italy has, yeah. right? Like you know, you just yeah, that's can't, a good argument for where to put them. You yeah. can't do as much in Copenhagen as you can nope. do in in Tuscany. Well, uh, yeah, and that was one thing that struck me yesterday was like there there would have been an opportunity, there there would have been opportunities to have an easier stage yesterday, yeah. But they decided not to do that, and for like Florence and Rimini being on the world stage and advertisement for the area yeah, I thought like a, a boring splinter stage like we had in Belfast 10 years ago at the Giro yep. didn't really do a lot much for Northern Ireland but <laughs> yesterday's stage was exciting today's was even more exciting and I think that kind of just yeah. adds to it. if you're trying to show, showcase the area yep. having an exciting stage to watch is going to potentially have more people tune in. Mm -hmm. Well, and I like that the Tour de France has not been afraid of hard stages early on, right? Like, they're yeah. not afraid to stick a stage like today or a stage like, like in Bilbao last year. I mean, yesterday's stage would have been fantastic if it wasn't oppressively hot, right? It's working. It makes the race exciting from day one. Very surprisingly, they do it two years in a row. Yeah. yeah. But We'd, brave, yeah. Do you remember the years when we used to have, like, five or six sprint stages and maybe a prologue chucked in uh. there straight out the bat? And it was... <laughs> It was crazy. I remember yeah. one of the first tours I watched, Pataki won like four stages out of the first six, and then like <laughs> the first time the road tilted upwards. I mean, it was like a motorway bridge. He got off. And went, <laughs> went over. I was like, what is this about? All right, we're, we're in the 85th minute. We're in the Slovakia has parked the bus. I'm, part glad, of this I'm, I'm sorry game. for everyone to have to deal with this podcast while we're watching the football. It's just timings. <laughs> um, hope you haven't tuned out. Any other thoughts on the first couple of days? I mean, so part of the reason I asked there, and I wanted Ronan's take because Ronan, you're out of here tomorrow. I'm yeah. gone. I'm heading to Frankfurt for Eurobike. Are you on the pod tomorrow, or are you going before? I'll that? be away before that. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. So be it. I'm going to come back earlier next year. Yeah. yeah, you're back at the end of the race as well, aren't you? Uh, oh, that's right. Yeah, back in Nice. Yeah, that'll <laughs> yeah. be nice. And then Ian shows up in a couple of days, and yeah, Joshua Robinson, the Washington Journal, will be back tomorrow, at least tomorrow. Yeah. Plus, we've got some other special guests lined up. Yes. Which will be fun. How special? Yeah, I'm not sure. They're very special. We'll I'm tell, not sure we'll who these tell are. Them they're special. Yeah. Before we wrap up for the day, well, of course we've got we'll Jose Bain in a little bit. We and we got a bit after dark, but I do want to. We, we caught up with Jack Haig this morning, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of you will know that we we publish a, a, a sort of every other week podcast with Jack called The Rest Day with Jack Haig. He interviews his teammates. He chats sometimes just with himself. Uh, anyway, we, we thought we'd catch up with Jack a couple times at the store because he's riding here with Bahrain Victorious. He's riding, uh, he's, he's been a podium contender previously, mm -hmm. would like to be again this, this, this month, I'm sure. And we just want to see how he's going. And he's, he provides a, a fascinating insight into inside the Peloton. He's rooming with Wout Poles, and so we'll get some a bit from Wout. Uh, you know, good buddies with Fred Wright, Johnny's favorite, and so we'll get some Fred Wright updates. But today, we just wanted to catch up with him for a couple minutes. So let's hear from let's hear from Jack. Let's see how Jack's doing so far. Mm -hmm. 
We are staying at the start of stage two. Yesterday looked pretty rough. Give us a little diary. How's it going so far? I think uh, yesterday was pretty interesting. I, I think the heat caught a lot of people by surprise. Everyone was talking about how UAE were going to smash it on the last four climbs and really make a big selection. But I think maybe they got a little bit nervous when EF started taking it up at the beginning and then they kind of disappeared from the front. And I think also Ayuso might have been struggling a little bit there because... UAE tried for a moment there and they went a little bit hard and then they immediately shut it down again. But I was surprised with EF taking control straight away and then I really didn't expect the breakaway to arrive to the finish. So chapeau to uh, DSM and Bardet. Was EF just Betiol? Were they just like, he's got Tricolore, we, we got we to gotta do something? I, I assume so. At one moment I also asked someone else in the peloton the same thing and they said, yeah, I guess it's for Betiol, Italian champion. I think he's from close to the area or maybe he lives in San, uh, San Marino or something. But um, yeah, I'm assuming that. How are you feeling? Pretty good. I uh, always do quite good in the heat. So I'm not, I'm not unhappy that it's hot, <laughs> but it was definitely very, very hot yesterday. So I hope today will be a similar thing and I hope I can get through in a similar way that I did yesterday. How do you approach a day like today that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky finale, it's, it's hard, but it's not sort of pure climbing in the way that you maybe would prefer? How do you kind of approach it tactically? Um, it's interesting. So I've done Giro del Emilia a couple of times now. We use the same climb, but it's a slightly different run-in. I imagine the first selection will be made on the third last climb. At the bottom of this climb, there's two really small, tight tunnels. And that'll really like thin out the bunch. And then if a team like UE or another team really want to make a selection there, it can be made. The San Luca climb, it's more of a sort of punchy five-minute style effort that someone like Primos or Tade can try and really go for those bonus seconds which are at the top. Thanks, Jack. We'll catch up with you, well, a lot, actually, this Tour de France. We'll see you in a couple days. Sounds good, guys. Thanks. Like I said, we'll be chatting with Jack throughout the race. Maybe every couple days we'll just catch up with him. He's also going to send some audio files over from, you know, hotel room chats in the evening when, when something happens at the tour we'll be we'll be relying on jack to provide us a bit of insider insight let's head over to jose bain who has our our cultural attache one might say who has a look at tomorrow's stage which is the longest of the race a Last two stages have been so long it we, guys we, you, have, you have any idea how much driving we have to do tomorrow we have like a two-hour drive to the start and then the stage itself and is like 230 k and we haven't had a chance to add either of you to the rental car yet, so I'm driving all of it. That's unfortunate. Uh, Much to Johnny's delight. But Jose Ben, Jose Ben is going to tell us a little bit about Fausto Coppi, one of my favorite riders ever. It's our last day on Italian soil, although I was kind of confused when I saw the route announcement. Plaisance Turin is our stage three. I searched for the town of Plaisance on Google Maps and found nothing in Italy. It was only then I realized the French Frenchified the name and we actually have to be in Piacenza. Benvenuti. At 229 kilometers, this is the longest stage of this year's Tour de France. Only five stages are longer than 200 kilometers, with most of them close to that 200 mark. It's a trend to make stages shorter and shorter. And one of the reasons behind this is extended television coverage from start to finish. And I know that people who love a flat 237 kilometer long stage from start to finish, but the ASO wants to cater to a younger public and make the broadcast shorter and more dynamic. The longest Tour de France stage ever was in 1990, the first race back after the horrors of the First World War. And the fact that the war was only seven months ago didn't inspire the organizers to take it easy. At 482 kilometers or 300 miles, stage five of that year's race is the longest stage ever. And with a total distance of 5,560 kilometers, the 1919 edition ranks second in the list of longest Tour de France's. The longest one was in 1926. Winner Lucien Bowser from Belgium needed 248 hours and 44 minutes for the 5,745 kilometers through France. Gradually, the tour got shorter and shorter, and the last edition of over 4,000 kilometers was in 1987. This century, the total distance is usually between 3,300 and 3,650, 
and this year we're bang in the middle of that figure with 3,492 kilometers. On our route today, we pass through Tortona. It's the first of three categorized climbs and Tortona got itself a place in the history books as the town where Fausto Coppi died. He contracted malaria in a race in Burkina Faso and died aged only 40 years young. This segment is way too short to give you a biography of Coppi. He is, of course, the winner of the 1949 and 52 Tour de France and the Giro d'Italia of these two years for that matter too. He could have won a few tours more, but in 1950 he refused to ride because his rival Gino Bartali would also be there. In 1951 he did ride with Bartali, but he was still struck by grief for his brother Serse Coppi, who died after crashing his front wheel in a Turin tram track and died in his brother's arms just a few days before the start of the race. And there was of course the controversy around the Dama Bianca, the white lady. Coppi was married, as was Giulia Locatelli, but they started a relationship with each other no matter what. And that was an absolute sin in Catholic Italy. The landlord of their apartment in Tortona was so appalled when the two lived together in sin that he threw them both out. And the Pope even asked Coppi personally to return to his lawful wife. But love is love and there was no stopping it. They eventually got married in Mexico, a marriage never officially accepted in Italy, and they had a son in 1955, Faustino. But he was born in Buenos Aires because of the huge scandal his parents had caused. How the times have changed, thankfully, I should add. So here's what we're doing in After Dark. First of all, we're going to tell you about Harold Tejada and what he's like in a taxi cab. Second of all, we have a couple, actually, I think we're going to use one of these because we've got a pile, but we're going to spread them out. And we want more too. We have, well, we have a comment from a listener. Uh, I mentioned this in a couple episodes ago. If you head to escapecollective.com slash hello, you can leave us a, a message, leave us a voicemail, basically. And it could be a hot take, it could be a cold take, it could be a question, it could be... An observation. You could sing, it's my birthday, you could sing me happy birthday. Well, yeah, we didn't actually mention that. I forgot to, <laughs> I was going to start with it, but then you asked me a question, I think, so I didn't say that. It is Katie's birthday, uh, and we are yet to give him his present. If anybody wants to Shall sing we me happy his birthday... Gift for after? Wait, do I have a present? No, no after, after dark. After, ah, after dark, okay. Just for us three. Ooh la la. <laughs> Bon that sounded weirder than it is. <laughs> oh, we're an extra time. This is rough. Sorry, Johnny. Yeah, just uh, keep, keep going with the podcast. We are... Send us, a, send us a note, and we might play it in a future episode. Might even answer your question. We're going to do, do some mailbags from the rest days. So we're going to be gathering questions and, and answering a, the, the, the best of the questions on our rest day pods. With that, if you're listening to the free feed, we are out of here. We'll see you tomorrow. If you're listening to the member feed, stick around because After Dark is coming. One Bye-bye. dollar membership this One month. One buck. You for could the first get, month. You could get a longer, possibly you, swearier you, podcast for one dollar. Podcast. For one dollar, you can find out which of Harold Tejada's teammates he mistaken for being Irish. He mistook for being Irish. And that is worth it. <laughs> for one dollar. I would pay way more. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.